Just imagine what it would be like if everything ran on wind power. Your communication systems would crash immediately without warning. Your wonderful cell phone wouldn't work. Your storage systems wouldn't work. I mean, it's just fantastic what is being proposed to uh, our nation for uh, our future, and particularly regarding electricity. Now is the time for the annual SEP <laughs> award, the coveted Jackson, a lump of coal <laughs> given to the nominee who has advanced or proposes to advance significant expansion of government power, even if it has no relationship to any scientific basis, <laughs> but claims it does. The nominee uh, declares that the, these advances in government power are needed for public health or the environment, and, but produces no scientific evidence that it is needed. And the nominee's arguments are flimsy at best. We have a number of distinguished nominees. They especially include Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, whose motto is, censor the skeptics. Then we have New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, whose motto is, sue the skeptics. Then we have Arizona Congressman Raul Gavarla, I apologize, Gavala. okay, whose motto is drive out the skeptics. <laughs> and of course, perhaps a grand champion is California Governor Jerry Brown, Whoa, whose motto is ignore the skeptics, build power, solar power plants, from, and get power from solar panels, which produce maybe 60% of their design capacity 20% of the time during the summer, and less during the winter. Or then his motto also is, get rid of those pesky soaring birds, build greater wind power farms, and what it will happen if you, you get stuck in traffic because the traffic lights don't work, because the wind doesn't blow, or you get stuck in an elevator, or worse, you're in an operation and the power fails. How many physicians would practice in a hospital that relies solely on wind power? All these distinguished candidates came in Second, to the winner, who is the notable Christina Figueres. Christina is the executive secretary, or was the executive secretary, of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. She was the one who brilliantly negotiated the Paris Agreement, getting about 190 countries to sign a meaningless piece of a paper, meaningless for all but a few countries, such as the United States. But she has now left the UNFCCC and has become the chairman of a new group, a subordinate group, that is expecting to receive, thanks to the Paris Agreement, and this international wonders that are happening, $1 trillion a year. This is called Mission 2020. 80 million, billion B will come from private sector, where, they don't say, one of the things being bounced around by international economists is tax financial tra transactions worldwide. 
The other 20 billion, 200 billion, I'm sorry, I get lost in these big numbers, uh, will come from governments, namely and primarily the U.S. Note the caption on the bottom of the line there. Let me translate it. We will destroy the economic system that has raised billions of people out of dire poverty and allows them to live healthier lives and longer lives. We will force them to return to a hand-to-mouth existence of squalor and disease. That is our noble winner for this year. I will also point out to say no one knows if the agreement, Paris Agreement, is binding or not. It was cleverly changed in the last moments to prevent it, to avoid letting it appear to be a treaty, therefore avoiding the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Mr. Obama loves this type of stuff. I am definitely a global warming skeptic. But what is a global warming skeptic? What kind of a background does he have? I started my semi-adulthood by volunteering for the United States Army to become a combat officer where I went to uh, chemical, biological, radiological warfare school. And there I saw truly toxic substance in action. One drop of VX, the chemical agent, knocked down a goat, would have paralyzed it, and would have killed it had not the instructors intervened with oxine and atropine and gave it artificial respiration. Not mouth to mouth, of course. <laughs> that taught me that every time I hear EPA talk about su toxic substance, they better give me some really convincing numbers. And I heard about dioxin being uh, one of the most toxic substances known to man. Forget it. Also, while I was uh, attending the chemical, biological, radiological warfare school, I learned about a substance called DDT and learned that it was the most effective way of controlling malaria in poor countries. Indoor spraying of huts would greatly reduce the malaria rates. When Ruckelhaus became head of the newly formed EPA, without any scientific basis of any uh, form worth in it, damn, he banned the use of DDT, and this became the springboard of attempts to ban it worldwide. Malaria rates soared. We killed, thanks to our government policies, millions of people from, the, uh, from preventable diseases. The, this ban indicated to me very clearly it doesn't make any difference about one's political party or his ideology. A dogmatist is a dogmatist, regardless. So through these experiences, I learned and verify your numbers. Make sure they're valid. Do the numbers support what is claimed? And if they don't, question the authorities that use them. I so also learned when I pointed out under federal government contract that the models being used to predict the world would run out of oil by the end of the 20th century were worthless for prediction. I found logical errors in the U.S. natural gas model submitted in my government report and found suspected, but I could not identify it, similar errors in the oil petroleum model used by the U.S. government. 
This taught me that ideologues don't care if their models are wrong as long as they promote the cause. Now, in global warming issues, we have a major theory that I think is wrong, and I'm going to briefly discuss it. In 1979, there came a very influential report called the Charney Report. If you'll notice, the Charney Report stated that a doubling of carbon dioxide would probably increase global temperatures plus by three degrees C, plus or minus 1.5 degrees C. But the laboratory results supporting that claim was very weak. In fact, they showed that there would be a laboratory re report showed a very modest warming from doubling CO2. The report came before we had atmospheric measurements of Front taken of temperatures taken by satellites that are comprehensive and the best measurements existing. It was speculation. It was speculation based on models, as you can read. In the early 1990s, finally, uh, Roy Spencer and John Christie published a paper showing how to use data being collected by satellites to measure atmospheric temperatures. And these uh, actual measurements show there is a very modest warming. And as Mr. Dr. Seringer says, the strong warming that is being shown now by the IPCC and other groups doesn't exist. It simply is not there. Again, the atmospheric measurements did not exist when this Charney report came, up, came out. And there were distinguished scientists that prepared it. The uh, thrust of the report is based on speculation from climate models. So what do we have that may indicate there's something wrong with what's going on with the climate models? Here you have the hotspot which uh, Dr. Singer discussed, doesn't exist. Here we have ice core data taken from Antarctica by the Russians. Uh, they started in about 1980s, but these did not become uh, well known until the 1990s. Uh, you may have seen them in Mr. Gore's film if you have watched it. It's this per period right here that is very interesting, the last warm period between a series of ice ages. Here we have CO2, and here we have temperatures. You have temperatures falling dramatically, while CO2 remains roughly the same. It's a period of over 14,000 years, so it's not a blip on the timeline. No, uh, in a, no one has addressed these issues, this disparity, and it's a significant disparity. I've seen some arguments on why it exists, but to physically, uh, to rigorously uh, state it, it is not coming. So, what we have here is a clear example that the statements from NOAA GIS, NASA GIS, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, that CO2 is the control knob of the Earth's temperature is nonsense. This problem with the temperature drop, well, CO2 uh, stayed high, is also found in Greenland ice cores, but not as starkly or as clearly. Here we again, we see the, uh, the actual temperatures taken by observations in the atmosphere and the atmosphere and what the models produce. There is one model that does well that comes across here. 
that seems to be tracking atmospheric temperatures well. That is by the Institute for Numerical Mathematics in Moscow. I asked uh, a scientist who was familiar with the model but was, did not work on it why their model seems to track well. They, it's adjusted to atmospheric temperatures where the greenhouse gases take effect, not to surface temperatures where the greenhouse gas is not where it takes effect and which are now really subject to real problems. And then in conclusion, I'd like to point out, this is a standard simplified model uh, that is used as a basis for constructing elaborate to computer models, and it is in here, the transfer of heat from the surface to the atmosphere that is thought to be resent back to the uh, surface that we have a major problem. This is a calculated value, it is not a measured value. We didn't have the capability of measuring it when this paper was published, and quite frankly, those who made their careers based upon the theory espoused by the Charney Report and global warming theory as shown in this model have no interest in revisiting the issues raised because they don't want to see their careers uh, stopped. Thank you.